All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm assuming that this is the three o'clock session because I'm going from Zoom room to Zoom room, like go from one to 159 and then hop over at two and 258, hop over to here. So this is the three o'clock uh, 10 tips class, correct? Am I in the right place? Yay, me. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. It's three, we're gonna start in a couple of minutes. Um, I know a lot of the sessions have had a ton of questions, so they've gone a little late. I know I've barely gotten out at like 158 and 259 for the two, so we're gonna wait a couple of minutes. But the sessions are being recorded as you hopefully saw. So if somebody, you know, again, doesn't mean they're horrible human beings, but somebody, you know, was talking to Agnes for 10 minutes about how to use OneDrive, then they can, you know, watch the recording and get that brilliant first 10 minutes of opening dialogue that I gave you guys, right? Everybody lying, go thumbs up. <laughs> there was brilliant opening dialogue? Yeah, 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 I just finished it. Yeah. All right, Peter, you need to smile when you say that or you terrify me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Like, all right, so we're going to start at 302, we're going to end at 304, and then it'll be 56 minutes of Peter giving us questions. That sounds good. <laughs> so yeah, we'll start in a minute or two. I like, since people are here, I like starting. And again, if someone joins us late, then we can get them caught up or whatever. But um, the one thing I will say as we get started, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I am not um the nazi of the unmute and or of the mute i understand people who do that i got no problem with it but as much as possible if you guys have questions if you guys don't understand something and want some additional clarification if you guys have a brilliant example because we've had a lot of them in the last two sessions of oh here's how i you know use multiple means of assessment for my class, or here's how I provide variety to my students or something like that, then please feel free to chime in. I mean, if it turns into a zoo, and I assume it won't because it hasn't yet, then you know I might hit that mute all button if it's 3.30 and we're on slide two. But short of that, I would love for you guys to chime in. I've got the chat window open. Because I know some people hate the talk out loud thing and turn unmuting themselves. So feel free to chat as well, but we're gonna get started. But it, again, if you guys have any questions, want any clarification, um, you know, every class goes different. The last class wanted resources left and white, right. They're like, where is that? Where is that? Can you send that out to us? So feel free to ask that question, um, you know, and then I'll just call in sick tomorrow and Colin will do it, right, Colin? <clears throat> sure. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, so apparently we're gonna have a apparently we're gonna have a home page template, which then expanded to can you do an entire 10 week template someone brought up. So yeah, that's that's why I love doing trainings, man. <laughs> and the problem is I was on Zoom and I wasn't thinking fast enough or could have done the I'm going through a tunnel and I'm breaking up response to it, but that didn't think of that quick enough. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I assume everybody's here for something along the lines of 10 tips for your students, 10 tips to successful online learning, something like that. 
Um, but we're going to go through it. Uh, as all of you know, 10 is a nice round number, so there's nothing magical about it. It could have been 9. It could have been 12. I combined a few and stretched a few and that sort of stuff. So don't focus on the 10. Um, some of these might be brutally obvious to some of you. Great. Okay. Some of this may be Greek to some of you. My apologies. But the goal is that hopefully at least a couple of you, or for all of you, at least a couple of times go, oh, that's a good idea. Or I hadn't thought of that. Or, ooh, gee, I never thought of that from a student's perspective. I, I should probably fix that and give you a few of those. Um, so let's go ahead and just get started then. Here we are. All right, and where's my chat? There we are. All right, so time for the obligatory, everybody sees the slideshow, correct? Yes, I need at least, yay, that man. Lori is like the world's quickest thumbs up giver person I've ever met in my life. It's like, I'm not even done with the question. She's like, you're good, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Appreciate that. All right, so let's get started. And the first slide, I've actually cheated, unsurprisingly. I'm pretending that this is a tip, but it's actually an ad for us, okay? Um, it actually is a tip, but I always want my first slide to be an ad for, ad for us. Um, we've got a lot of resources available to you guys. Lean into it, okay? We've got trainings this week, and we'll send that schedule out later today. Uh, we have um, weekly trainings we're going to be offering, and we'll make those available to you. Uh, we'll record them. We'll archive them. So we're going to have stuff available asynchronously. You don't have, I mean, we'd love for you guys to attend, for example, the Thursday 715 session on Panopto that we're doing for how you can record your Zoom lectures in your classes. Please show up for that. We'd love to have you. But if you can't, we're going to record it, send the link out so that, you know, some of you are teaching, some of you are busy, some of you are sleeping in. Sorry, 715, man, trust me, I, I'm with you, man. It hurt me, but 715 was actually the latest. They had a 6 a.m. one, and I'm like, dude, I just won't go to bed if you're going to offer a 6 a.m. training. It's not worth it. Um, so make that available to you. I do want to draw your attention to that library at batestech.edu email. Um, yes, this is about e-learning, but I mean, in addition to the fact that it's in my job title, so I'm kind of legally obligated to say it, I also want to say the library absolutely views themselves and should as a partner in your guys' e-learning. So if you're talking about curbside drop-off to get equipment and resources available to you or your students, if you're talking about uh, researching open educational resources, so someone's teaching a course and there's a $90 textbook that you normally just let the students pick up and read in class and you don't want to make them read or pay 90 bucks for something that you know you only use for two days of class, talk to the library, talk to Mike and go, hey, is there a free resource that I can make available to our students? We've got videos that are available, uh, articles. So if you're looking for any content, you're looking for any assistance on that, just send an email to that library at batestech.edu and let them uh, help you and assist you in building or improving your courses. And that last bullet, of instructional designer. That is a service we off, it's a, it offer. Honestly, it's something that a lot of you haven't taken advantage of, so I would like to politely encourage you, okay? If you're running this stuff and going, man, my discussion boards stink. I just, I just get me too for 18 different people, or my assignments just seem to be boring. What are some ways that I can spice that up? Or, you know, it doesn't have to be horrible. You say, hey, I think mine are going good, but what are some ways that I can improve it? Then let us know. We'd love to kind of sit down and go over your course with you and give you some feedback for some different tools you can use, some different ways to structure it, some different ways of doing things. Okay. All right, so uh, our second tip, and we're saying this because it's today, is start early. Um, I'm gonna send out mod zero a little bit later today. We really wanna encourage you to import this into your course and to go live and start your class even as early as tonight or tomorrow. Um, let's talk about, let's back up for a second and talk about this. First, a lot of your students might be new. And when I say new, I don't just mean new debates. You probably have a lot of students who are very new and possibly quite terrified of online learning. So. If you open your course early this week, maybe tomorrow or Wednesday, you give them a chance to go in, 
to get comfortable, to navigate your course, to navigate Canvas, to find out what the buttons are, that Mod Zero has some very simple, easy, low stakes assignments and resources. So for example, they can post to a discussion board. The nice thing is it's not have, asking them, you know, about what microphone they would use. Sorry, Roland, I'm looking at you here. You know, what microphone they would use or what mixer to use, but it's just saying, hey, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Tell us about what your e-learning experience is. So it's a low stakes, low pressure way for them to get into cannabis and get started. The other huge benefit of this is if there's issues, I assume all of you would much rather find out about an issue that your student has, like I don't have a laptop, I'm gonna do the whole thing on my cell phone, I don't have bandwidth, I've got eight kids, you know, and I only have 12 minutes a day to do homework. You know, hopefully that isn't any of your students, but if that is, I assume all of you would rather find that out three days before the class starts versus in week five of the course. So that's the other benefit of mods. If there's issues, it surfaces these, and um, you know, you get a chance to deal with those. I hope it doesn't come down to a maybe this isn't a good fit for you, but again, if it is, we'd rather have that happen this week than a couple of weeks from now. Okay, um, the Mod Zero is brand new. Ken, it was just published this morning. It's got a few updates. Uh, some of the features, for example, in um, student resources are no longer available. So we've got some COVID updates that are in there. We've got the uh, college readiness survey in there, which gets you some good feedback about your students. So we've really updated it. You know, we've had some, oh, we should do that. So we kind of just sat down and really overhauled it pretty well. And so the nice thing is if you already have mod zero in your course, then you now should have gotten a notification saying, hey, mod zero has been updated and you just tell it to update it. It'll update it in your courses, okay? If not, you can just download it. Again, we'll send that link or you can go to Canvas Commons and type in mod zero, one word, and it's there available for you, okay? So any questions on that? I always like pausing. Ken, did we answer your question? Yes, all right. Unless I was Ken typing it early going, yes, I have lots of questions. <laughs> All right, so the next tip. Um, I know a lot of you might have been new to Canvas, and so we want to take a moment and say congratulations. If this was you in March and you say, yay, I didn't drown, my students didn't drown, we kept our head above water, then we say congratulations. You know, good for you. We're glad that happened. But we do want to make you aware there's some additional races that are built directly into Canvas that you can use. You know, once you said, I know how to make a page, I know how to make a quiz, I know how to do an assignment, there's some other stuff that's built into it. So we want to draw your attention to a few of them. One of the big ones is academic integrity. This is a huge issue, and we've already run into this um with some programs including one program where we found some academic non-integrity that actually dated back we found it several years that answers were being shared among students um, so two resources we're offering you it's free to you guys and free to your students want to stress that uh, the college or the state is footing the bill for this uh, we have honor lock which is a test proctoring service so if you're doing your, um, you know, your final exam, it's really simple. Uh, you go in, you click on the honor lock button in Canvas and you say, I want this test to be proctored by honor lock. It'll give you a bunch of questions like, do you want them to have access to a calculator? Yes or no. Are there any websites you want them to have access to during the course? You know, so it'll ask some basic questions on that and you say yes or no or type the information in and then they will actually proctor it for you. So let's say your test is from eight to nine. At eight o'clock, it goes live. Your students take the test and HonorLock will actually proctor it. And I want to stress this point. HonorLock does not take any action against your students. It's not like they're going to kick them out of the room or something like that. You know, if any of you ever took the SAT or something like that, that's not the type of proctoring we're talking about. What they will do is they will proctor it and then they will send you an email. So what they might say is, Ken, uh, you should take a look at uh, Susie's student at the 18 minute mark. It looks, you know, their eyes are doing this a whole lot. It looks like they might be looking at something off screen. So they will take no action, they will just fly it, and then Ken can go in and look at it and then decide, nope, I'm not concerned about it, or I'm gonna send an email to the student and give them a warning, 
or Ken can even say, nope, that guy's cheating. I'm giving him a zero and I'm referring him. So he's got the full range of options, but he is going to be the one that does it. Onalock just simply flags it. Okay, same thing with Unicheck. It's a simple thing. Uh, you, when you create an assignment that's online submitted, you just turn it on. And again, they're not going to flunk the student or anything like that. They're going to send Ken that email or they're going to notify him and he can go in and look and go, oh man, Johnny student again, this passage right here from this assignment he did, 98% matches this paragraph in Wikipedia. And again, he can decide whether or not he wants to take action, what the action is. But Unicheck is an academic integrity and sort of flag stuff that might be uh, potentially plagiarism. Okay, so we're going to have a training about both of those this week. Be on the lookout for that. We're just going to walk you through the basic steps of how to do it and answer any questions you guys have on it. We've got some other features as well. We've got Atomic Search, which I don't know if you guys have used it. It's fabulous. It's a comprehensive search that we paid for and it's in Canvas. So if you say, you know, oh man, I had that PowerPoint slide that I used a couple of years ago. If you can just remember the name of it or even text that was on it because it's completely indexed. So if you remember, oh, I don't remember anything about that, but I remember slide four used the phrase ribonucleic acid. Then you tell it to search for everything in your courses that has the phrase ribonucleic acid, PowerPoint, PDF, uh, Word documents, and it'll bring all that up, okay? So that's a huge resource that's out there for you guys. We've got Badger. Um, and you can um, use that in order to create its badging. So for example, if you're teaching something that's competency-based, you can tell your students, okay, when you collect these five badges, you've completed the course, or you have to get three of these five done in order to pass it. But basically, it has them perform tasks and then awards them a badge. Um, and then the last thing is just accessibility. ReadSpeaker is a very basic thing that you should be uh, making sure that your students are aware of. It's that orange play button in the bottom left corner. And all your students have to do is simply click on it and then it will read this. Uh, if it's a page, it'll read that page out loud to them, okay? And you say, well, why should we do that? Well, first of all, we're legally required to if there's a, someone who might uh, be blind or be visually impaired in any way. But also, it also helps a lot of students. Maybe your students don't read well. Uh, maybe your students are getting of a certain age and when they leave their glasses at home, they can't read. So the ability to have it read to them. Maybe English is in their lang native language or maybe not a visual learner. So having someone read along with them as they're reading it as they go along is a huge assistance. So this is something, we'll talk about accessibility a little later, but this is something that just requires the click of a button. So please make sure that your students are aware of it. Okay. And Angela gave us an LOL, but I, it, she does raise a good point. You know, if you find that your students rebel against honor lock or say that it's a gross invasion of privacy or it ends up being more of a headache because you have to review 517 different instances, honor lock is not mandated. It's something that we offer to you. So if Angela's just making a joke and I don't see her here, then great, we'll LOL along with you. But if this is a legitimate complaint, because that does happen, then Angela, you're not required to use it or your department isn't required to. It's offered as a service and if it ends up being more hassle, then great, let's talk about a different way to provide academic integrity because there are legitimate concerns about it. And so we're not gonna take a side and say, your students have to. If it's gonna cause more harm, then great, let's find a better way to do that. Okay, any questions on this page? All right. On we go. All right. Uh, and next way to increase student success is what's called multiple means. And so you see your fancy schmancy words there, multiple means of representation and engagement and expression. But the basic thing is vary your class as much as possible. Now I know there's classes, PNUR might be one of them, where it's really structured because they have exams and certifications that they have to pass. But if you've got any level of flexibility, especially in an online class, the more you can provide some variety. For example, teach in different ways. That's that multiple means of representation. Maybe half your classes are lecture and then the other half you do different ways. Like you have them watch videos of different instructors or you have them read some textbooks or you maybe do group presentations. So do some different things other than I'm just lecturing for an hour. Uh, multiple means of engagement. The more that you can let them go through their life and talk about stuff that's important to them, what's going on with them. You know, for example, you know, if you, uh, you know, I've got Ken enrolling 
assignment here. So maybe instead of having them do the assignment that they typically, typically do, he's going to have them go around and record interesting items in their house, you know, something that they're going to be more interested in than maybe a textbook assignment. So give them ways of having them tap into stuff that interests them, you know, their house, their life, their culture, their life experiences, their strengths. And then finally, multiple means of expression. And this is tough because I realize when you're going online, it's so easy to do a multiple choice quiz. You know, you're trying to juggle 16 chainsaws and five cats. I get it. Okay, so you say, you know what, if I do a multiple choice 25 question quiz, Canvas grades it for me, Canvas does it, great, I understand that. But if you have the ability of the capability of bandwidth evaluating in different ways, because the fact is your students may be really bad at multiple choice quizzes, you know, I assume all of you, if you've taught for more than 15 seconds in front of the student who knows the material, and the second you say the word quiz, and even if you call it an assessment, they know that's a synonym for quiz, so the second you make it a quiz, all their knowledge comes pouring out of their ears. So if you can have them, for example, maybe create a video, maybe demonstrate it in the lab, you know, but find a different way of, of evaluating them. And again, feel free to do as many multiple choice quizzes you need. Nothing wrong with that, but if you can give some variety in that ways and maybe give the students an ability to demonstrate that knowledge in a second way. One of the things that some of the other instructors in other classes have said is they love giving options. So for assignment three, what they'll do is they'll say, you have a choice. You can write a three page essay, you can do a three minute video, or you can create a piece of art and submit it. You know, or you can do it individually, or you can do it in a group of four. So give your students different ways of demonstrating their mastery of it and give them some flexibility, add some variety to the class. Okay, this is always somewhere I hit the hard pause because I'm going to ask you guys, what are some different ways that you guys do this, different ways of teaching, different ways of evaluating? Do we have any brilliant ideas we'd like to share? Because we've got some good ones in the other classes. Hi, Tim. This is Joe Brewer from Autobody. Hi, Joe uh, Brewer from Autobody. Uh, my, my students have, we use the iPad and video them with their consent and mm -hmm. while they're doing some of their painting. Um, and then we come back into the classroom before we had COVID and we uh, go over that video so they could actually see themselves making mistakes visually. And that seemed to, they, the class seemed to really enjoy that. Yeah, I, I can see why they would. That's great. Um, you know, provided you don't go, ha ha, yeah, I assume you don't do that. And it's a positive experience. So yeah, the ability to see that. Uh, if you don't mind, can I ask a follow-up question? Joe Brewer, uh, can, uh, have you found a way to do that in online instruction? Not yet on online. I probably could film it myself and then post it on there. But um, so yeah, I could do that online, sure. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm just, again, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just asking, we're trying to share instruction. Um, you know, is, and again, is there anything that the students could do? And this is rhetorical kind of, but is there anything the students could do at home in video and send it to you? That might be another way to do it. And I realize they probably can't paint a car in their garage. I get that, but you know, anything that they could do as well and video and show it. Okay, any other suggestions or ideas or brilliance? I think now is the time where I'm legally required to say I have two daughters, so I'm really used to awkward silence, so you guys don't intimidate me. <laughs> All right, next up, accessibility. We talked about this a little bit, um, and if any of you have ever attended one of our accessibility trainings, you've heard me talk about this, so I'll be kind of brief, but I do want to stress this to people. A lot of people, when they hear about accessibility, they say, oh, I've got a blind person or a person with limited sight or a deaf person or something like that. And that is true. We are legally required to do things like caption our videos, you know, provide tag PDFs, things like that. Um, but what we're talking about now is what's called universal design for learning. And that basically started with architecture. Um, the thought process was let's design buildings, let's design spaces in ways that the maximum number of people get the maximum usage out of it. Okay, so you know, I, I 
don't have a lot of people on screen, so it won't make you, make you raise your hands, but you can, you know, in the privacy of your own room. But, you know, how many of you have had a bunch of grocery bags or a kid or a stroller and had to open a door and have been very thankful for that button that you can smack with your elbow and open a door? You know, how many of you and my hands up on this have had knee surgery or now have bad knees or again, have a kid stroller and you were very thankful for a ramp instead of stairs or an elevator instead of stairs, okay? How many of you, um, you know, don't really like crowds and you notice it when you're in a tight place walking through a place, but you walk into the Bates uh, downtown near the auditorium, the courtyard there and go, I appreciate the fact that this is a wide open space and I can navigate through here. Okay, when we deal with accessibility, yes, we um, make it so that people who, you know, again, are blind, are in a wheelchair, have social anxiety disorder, general anxiety, can use our facilities. We also just make it a more pleasant and enjoyable and utilitarian time for everybody. That's the thought process behind accessibility. Okay, yes, if someone uh, doesn't have the correct hearing level in order to hear something, uh, you know, whether they're deaf or they have limited hearing, you know, military people, for example, it's really common, four times more likely than the general population to be suffering from some level of hearing loss. Yes, we legally need to put captions on there. But again, I'll ask you guys, um, how do you use captions all the time? You know, I'm reaching the age where my audio discrimination is getting really bad. So I turn the captions on almost all the time when I'm watching a movie. How do you use captions late at night so you don't wake up the family or you do it in bed so you don't wake up your spouse? You know, uh, how many of you have watched a video with somebody with a very thick accent that you couldn't understand? So you turn the captions on to be able to read along and figure out what they were saying. So none of those were legally required to provide, but it made it much easier for your students to participate and to get the maximum amount of usage out of your course. So we want to do those, and what we really want to stress more than anything is the visual accessibility. Yes, we should do everything, but as you design your courses, realize, and sorry, I've got the virtual background, so you can kind of sort of see that I'm holding a phone, but there we are. Realize a lot of your students are taking your course on that mobile device. Uh, so small screen, possibly limited bandwidth, possibly a data plan. So keep that student in mind, okay? Uh, for example, look at this. This is the most boring PowerPoint you've ever seen in your life, right? Go ahead and say it. You're not gonna hurt my feelings, okay? But it's deliberate because the fact is, while this may be boring and it might offend you, it's really easy to read. It is large, clean letters, white background, black font. Can't get any easier than this. Okay, so as you're designing your canvas, I would start with 14. I know it's a pain in the butt. I have been screaming at Canvas for at least three years to be able to up the default setting as an institution, but we can't. But start it at 14 point font, keep the clutter out. Don't put a picture in unless you need it. Obviously, if it's a schematic, put it in there. If it's a critical picture for the essay, put it in there. But don't just put extra pictures in because that's how you express your creativity because it makes it more difficult for the student to read that on that phone. And again, it's taking up their bandwidth. Okay? Yes, Lori. Did I miss the part where you talked about the live closed captioning or is that still part of our uh, toolbox? That is not part of our toolbox at this point in time. We are willing to pay for it, but nobody has approached us. So if you want to provide live captioning for your Zoom lectures, uh, we would be interested in it, but we would need to see something where it made it worth the expense. I think right now we can pay $20 a month for an individual instructor to use it. So feel free to let us know if that's something that would help you guys out. Jim? Yes. This is Valerie. I have late breaking news from Agnes about captioning. Yes. She said it's been added to um, a software platform that we currently hold. And she mentioned it in passing and I thought it was an amazing piece of news. So okay. I, wanna off I wanna offer that and let you know that we can find out from her where she found it and how to access it. And it, it could very well be an automated process the way she it sounded like it was automated yeah. great 
then thank you for that, Valerie. We will look into that and let you guys know, because yeah, we did offer Rev, but we were part of a beta test for that. And once we had to pay for it, we, we went away. Um, so if we can make that available free and automate it, awesome. We'd be thrilled with that. All right, next up, standardize. And what we're talking about here, uh, this is actually a complaint we get uh, frequently from students is they're trying to navigate your course and whether it's you or much more frequently, it's different instructors in the program. It can be very hard because, you know, instructor A says, here's how my Canvas course is set up. Instructor B says, here's how my Canvas course is set up. Instructor C says, here's how my Canvas course is set up. And they have nothing to do with each other. It does happen sometimes as an individual because some people don't organize their material. They just kind of throw all the assignments in and say good enough. So, you know, the, the fancy schmancy word again we use is neural bandwidth. But the basic term that that means is your students only have so much thinking in them. Okay. And so as an instructor, you want your students to use those brain cells for the assignment itself and the work that they're doing and the reading you want them to do. You don't want them to use up those brain cells trying to figure out where the heck the reading is or what you're asking for in the assignment or even, God forbid, how to find the assignment. You know, if you've taken enough online classes, all of us had the experience where it took us 15 minutes or half an hour to find the assignment or the reading we were supposed to do in order to complete the assignment because it was buried somewhere. So the more that you can make it standardized, the more it can make everything super easy to find. Again, the more of that brain power your students can use on digesting the information you're giving to them and demonstrating their mastery, which is what we're after, okay? Um, oops. I've got a sample module up here, that second bullet. Um, I do not in any way, shape, or form say that I am Moses coming down from the mountain with the stone tablets, but this is a sample module that you could do. And pretty much any time I teach, this is the module that I use. I'll say, here's week one. The first thing I'm going to have is an intro and an introduction and the objectives. Here's what we're going to learn this week. Here's what you're going to be able to do by the end of these five days, or these seven days, or this module. Okay. Then I put the instruction underneath that. Here's the videos. Here's the lectures. Here's the readings. Here's the websites. Underneath that, I put the homework for them to complete. Underneath that, I put the assessment. And then underneath that, I put the supplemental information. Again, I'm not saying it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's a very functional thing. But as you look at that, I think all of you can see, if I had that on week one, week two, week three, week four, as you go through the course, I'm spending less and less effort to navigate the course. And all of that effort is going towards actually completing the content in the course because they go, oh, here's, my, here's where the objectives are. Here's where the homework's gonna be. Here's the assessment. Tied in with that, again, I know this isn't an option for some courses, but the more you can tie in consistent days and time, so I know that Wednesday is homework day, I know that Friday by 5 p.m., everything has to be turned in, I know Monday at 8 a.m., the module goes live, the more you can make that stuff consistent, the less they're trying to juggle home and keep checking their calendar to find out or keep hitting the refresh button to see if it's available. As they go through the course, they start learning this is the way the course is run, and they kind of get on autopilot. Related to that, I want to encourage you guys to prune your course. And I want to be very clear here, okay? I am not in any way, shape, or form saying, hey, Peter, can you just take half your course and throw it into the ocean to make it easier for your students, okay? That is not what we're saying. But what we are saying, utilize what's called backwards design. And what that means is ask yourself, what is it that my students need in order to get through this class? What skill do they have to demonstrate so that I can say that they finished this module? And then work backwards. So say, okay, here's what they need to know. Here's what they need to demonstrate. Here's how I'm going to assess it. And then here's the information that I'm going to present to them. Okay. Um, the problem is a lot of us, and I absolutely include myself, go the exact opposite way. I go, here's the readings that they need to complete. And then here's how I'm going to test them on whether they understood the readings. Or I say, here's this great exercise I want them to do. Well, it might be that they don't need those readings, okay? So again, I'm not saying just get rid of it in order to make people, in order to make the class easier. But if you take a hard look at that 50 pages of reading you gave them and go, you know what? Man, 
I know my students are struggling. We're going to talk about this in a second. Um, yeah, I could really cut this down to just one chapter. I think with 12 pages, you know, they can still get the key information out of there. Or I know I give them three assignments, but I think if I take this one assignment and tweak a little bit, we can get by with just one assignment. So the more that you can prune it down, your students, we've got a ton of data. Um, a lot of it has come out. And one of the overwhelming things we're finding out is that students are not struggling with what we thought they were going to. There are still significant students that are struggling with internet access. There are still students that are struggling with only doing it on their phone. They don't have a working computer. Uh, they don't have good internet access. They don't have the good software. But we're finding that's more like maybe about a third of the class. What we're seeing is that for students who are saying difficulty, a much higher percentage are saying it's things like time management. Um, you know, the real obvious one that a lot of us are struggling with, I've got one or two or five kids that are now at home and I thought they were gonna be gone from nine to three every day, okay? And so students are saying, you know what? At the end of the day, I do this, I do homework, I'm working part-time or full-time. After I get my kids to bed at 9.30 at night, I'm sitting down to work and you're getting half an hour from me. So if you give me half an hour of homework, I'll give you half an hour of effort. If you give me two hours of homework, I'm giving you half an hour of effort. And again, I'm not telling you guys how to teach your class. I wanna be super, super clear on this point. If you say in order for them to pass the class, they have to put in two hours, I get that. No one's criticizing that. But if there's any way to prune it, to chunk it into manageable bites, break it up into smaller parts so that you can make it so that those students who have 15 minutes to half an hour of bandwidth that they can devote to your class can get through it. The more you can do to help them with that, the more success they're gonna have and the higher your retention rates and the higher your success is gonna rate. I'm gonna stop in case anyone wants to make a comment or scream at me, go ahead. Um, I provided a page that explained how to do academic reading as opposed to like pleasure reading when you sit back and read a novel because we don't really read textbooks that way. It's more like I have a question in mind and then I go through and try to find the answer and it's much quicker, it involves skimming and so forth because I, I don't want students to sit back and read 50 pages as if they were reading a novel, but instead right. read trying to find it. So I, I made a page that tries to explain that to students. Would you mind sharing that in comments? Sure. And emailing us? We'd love to, and that's, and that's a great idea. That's a way that you can, again, eliminate some of that burden on the student and say, hey, I know it's taking you three hours to read this. You should be done in 40 minutes if you right. do it this way. That's an awesome thing. Thank you. Okay. Any other suggestions or comments? All right, pop quiz. In the chat box, should your, the majority of your content be synchronous, meaning live or asynchronous? A, it's a trick question, and B, the answer is on the screen, because I believe in very easy pop quizzes. So go ahead and type your answer in. Should your content be synchronous or asynchronous? Oh, man, I get the smartest participants in my course. You guys are awesome. All right, so let's talk about this for a second. You guys rocked. You got it right. Um, Bates and myself specifically, um, had a very flawed notion at the beginning of this pandemic. I was encouraging asynchronous very strongly and for good reason. I said, you know what? We've got um, students with, we've got a digital gap. Uh, we've got students who are gonna be struggling. We've got flexibility issues. Um, we've got people who are working full time. We should make our content asynchronous so students can access it 24 seven, whatever time works best from them. And there's nothing wrong with that thought process. but We've got a wealth of data that has come out over the last six months. And what students have said overwhelmingly is that they prefer synchronous when possible. And you see some of the reasons why, okay? They're socially isolated, they're lonely. Some of them are struggling with mental health issues like depression, okay? And so the ability to nine to 10 every day to check in, to say hi, to see their instructor, to see their classmates. Man, I can tell you, I have a 14 year old who just spent, you know, three months of summer by herself. And she is ecstatic to even see teachers who she hates, not that she hates any teachers, but she's just ecstatic to see a second individual other than her dad, who she is so sick and tired of. 
So giving them that sense of community, giving them the structure so that they know, and in some cases it literally is, I have dibs on the computer from nine to 10, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because you've got different people battling for it. So knowing that that nine to 10 is that time, the, the students have said, this is what we want. We want that sense of community. We want that sense of structure. We like that intermediate feedback where we can dialogue with our instructor. So as much as possible, and again, I say as much as possible because I know it doesn't work with some of you with your students and your population and your classes, but as much as possible, providing them at least some synchronous interaction in the course is something that, again, is a wealth of data saying this is something that really benefits the students, both academically and even socially and mentally. Okay, the best practice we recommend is both. So if you're doing a Zoom session or a lecture, record it using Panopto. Here's that ad for that 715 training on Thursday, which will also archive it. Um, record the lecture and then post it to the class so that they can do it. Also make some parts synchronous that lend themselves to that and make some parts asynchronous. Okay, um, and Peter makes a great comment. We said, you gotta know your class, okay? If they show up from nine to 10, great. I've had instructors who said, oh, I set up virtual office hours. This is gonna be so great. And they did it for two weeks and they had one person show up in two weeks. Okay, then find a different way to do it. You know, I don't know if it's gonna work for you or not. You know, it may be that your student population doesn't, but overall, students like and appreciate that synchronous, okay? Related to that and that whole social interaction, as much as possible, especially if it's an online only class, build a sense of community in that class. This is one of the single best things you can do. And this is something that there's not six months, there's 20 to 30 years of data saying the more that that student views that course as a community, the more that they view you as a person, the more that they develop an identity with that group, the more success that they're gonna have and the higher your retention levels are going to be. And again, this isn't a new one. This is something that's been around for decades. Okay. So have a good homepage so that when they get in, it's something welcoming, friendly. Um, the first five minutes of the class are the most important five minutes of the class. Uh, you know, a lot of you have taken online courses. We've all taken courses where you hit the home page and you go, this is going to be a good course. My instructor knows what they're doing. It's laid out cleanly. I can figure out what it's going on. And some of us have had the exact opposite experience. You enter a course and literally 15 seconds into it, you go, oh no, this is going to be bad. Um, I don't want to pick on my daughter's school, so I'm not going to name the school district that she attends, but I looked at one of their sessions that they had, and literally every single link on the page was broken, including those little icons that said, this image is broken. So it had like 15 broken image links. Yeah, that says this course is not going to go well. So have a welcoming, well-designed homepage, have a meet the instructor page, especially again, if they're not gonna see you, if it's not a hybrid course, so if they learn a little bit about you and view you as an actual human being with likes and interests, you know, put a picture on there. I don't hear as many people push back against this because I think most of you have accepted it, but at least a few years ago, I had a lot of instructors. I don't wanna put a picture on there. Find a good professional one and put it on there. It really makes a difference that someone says, this is my instructor versus this is the robot who teaches my course or monitors my course, okay? And related to that, have a robust instructor presence. And I don't know what that looks like. Again, you know, Peter made the great point that he tried and his students didn't show up. I don't know what's gonna work for you. You can rotate through these and see what works, but virtual office hours may be a great way to do it. Maybe you schedule people so it's mandatory. It's a 10 point assignment for you to show up once a week and talk to me for 15 minutes. So I can at least say, how are you doing in the course? How are things going? You know, discuss an assignment with you. Um, I want to take a moment and give you guys the highest possible praise that I can give you. We got so much great feedback on the student surveys, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, for all the instructors who hunted their students down. And again, that's a positive. <laughs> it could be taken negative. But we heard so many things about my instructor emailed me. My instructor texted me. My instructor took the time to call. We got so many students who commented on how that made them feel and how they felt like their instructor cared about them and made them feel like they were part of the course and said, 
hey, what's going on? You know, we had instructor last class who said every single time a student missed his class, he called them and at least left a, a not five second voicemail saying, hey, we missed you in class, hope things are going well, hope we see you tomorrow, okay? That's instructor presence. Um, feedback, you can give students feedback, not just good job, but let them know how they're doing in the course. Uh, maybe it's monitoring the message board so that they don't just think that they're posting and they get their five points and say, me too, and move on. You know, so Roland leaps in and says, man, this is a great point this person is making. Do you guys understand why this is important? Or, you know what, it's half right. Can anyone tell me the, the point that this person left out though? Or can someone give me an example of this? So you're monitoring that and letting them know that you're actually alive and reading the stuff that's being posted in there. Um, one of the most profound educational experiences I've ever had, this message students who. So most of you are aware of this, but inside the grade book, you've got a feature where you can message students who. And so you can click on that and you can say things like message students who haven't turned in the assignment. So it's super nice because you don't have to go into your inbox and open that up and then remember what students did. It's just straight from your grade book. You can say, hey, students A, B, C, and D, the assignment was, is due at midnight and they don't have yours yet. But the profound experience I had was the instructor asked, how many of you know the message students function? And a lot of people raised their hand and said, oh, I do. I'm aware of that. I know that. Then the instructor said, how many of you message students who do well in your class? And not a single person in the room raised their hand, okay? And that's something that stuck with me for years now because I think, and I understand why we do, we view these students as at risk or ready to drop out and we're trying to bring them back into the course, whether it's because we care about them or for FTEs or for all of the above, but I do want to encourage you guys, because something I took with me, just because a student's getting a B plus in your class doesn't mean that they're not struggling. Doesn't mean that they don't have life situations. So maybe just messaging students who got a good grade on a test and saying, great job, it's very clear that you studied, keep up the good work. That bit of encouragement might be what gets them over the hump as things go to hell in a handbasket in their personal life. So I know a lot of you do a great job of following up people who miss classes and I'm sorry to say, hey, here's one more task for you guys. Feel free to punch me next time you see me, but you know, maybe provide some feedback and positive encouragement to your students who are doing well. We want to encourage you guys to do that as well. Okay. All right. And then our last um, slide, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but want to tell you this is going to be the focus of the next three months of class. Uh, so we're going to have some, we're going to start in with a couple of kind of overview trainings this week, and we're going to be offering lots of training on this. Um, and so we're going to talk about some issues of compliance. The reason you're hearing about this again and again and again, you heard about it several times today, you know, twice from Valerie, once from me, so that's three times in a couple of hours just in one day, is basically if, um, you know, Amanda was teaching PNUR 101 and it was normally face to face. And so Amanda Transition is now teaching it online. Basically, for lack of a better term, the Department of Education kind of looked the other way. They said, okay, we understand, you know, you're thrown into the fire, you're treading water, you might not have used all the best practices, that's fine. Just, you know, get your students through the year. The Department of Education is no longer doing that. Starting January 1st, a man is no longer allowed to say, oh, this used to be, a, or this is a face-to-face -face class, and it's going to go back to face-to-face, -to -face, so I don't need to meet all those standards. If PNUR 101 come January 1st is being offered online or hybrid, Amanda, no matter what, is now being held to all the standards of an online or hybrid class. And this is the list that Bates is operating off of. We've got checklists on our websites. We're going to email these out to you guys. Again, we'll do training. It's not like you're not going to hear about this. Um, the one thing I want to stress is please don't look at this and as we talk about this, freak out and go, oh my God, all the things that Bates wants me to do. Okay, we really, really want to stress, we're here to train you, to help you, to be a second set of eyes, to provide resources for you, to give you checklists so you don't have to guess what regular and substantive interaction is, but to say, here is what the Department of Education has defined it. Here's a checklist. If you've got seven of these nine, you should be in good shape. 
Okay, we're going to give you tools like Honor Lock so that you can say if a program or creditor comes in, the question they're going to ask is, hey, Roland, how do we know that Johnny student's work was done by Johnny student? We're going to work with Roland so that Roland can say, here's how I know that fact. And by the way, it doesn't have to be Honor Lock. I had a fantastic conversation with Kathy Brock last week who talked about she designs all of her assessments so the students can talk among themselves, so they can Google, so they can call up experts and ask for their opinion. And part of that is even some analysis after the assignment is turned in saying, here's what I learned doing this assignment. That absolutely meets a standard. The only, it's not that the only way you can meet standards is by going zap and zapping everybody who uses their cell phone on a test. There's lots of ways to meet academic integrity. So we're gonna make that stuff available to you guys and we're gonna provide trainings, but more than anything, the goal is we wanna come alongside you and say, here's a solution that works great for Peter. Here's a solution that works great for Roland. Gosh, Ken, that's a really hard thing. Let's research and then get back to Ken and say, hey, this might be a thing that research that works well for you, okay? So these six, just real quickly, Quality just basically means it has to be a quality course now, okay? I mean, I hope it was in the past, but again, we acknowledge that some of you were doing this for six months. Now, it needs to be what's called an equivalent educational experience, which means if somebody would have taken Amanda's PNUR 101 course in fall of 2019, and they're taking it now in fall of 2020 online versus face-to-face, -face, they're getting an equivalent, not equal, but they're getting an equivalent level of knowledge, an equivalent level of information, an equivalent level of research, of feedback, of evaluation, all of these things. And again, I want to stress, it doesn't mean that both have them read 150 pages of a textbook. It could be a completely different overhauled course. But when both students complete the class, you can't tell which one's the face-to-face -face and which one's the online because the online person clearly got 50% of the knowledge of the face-to-face -face person. Okay, so that's the big one. That's NWCCU and that's Department of Education and that's also gonna be your program accreditors are gonna require that, okay? Regular and substantive interaction means that you're actually in the course. We talked about this with instructor presence. There's a lot of ways to do it, but basically what they're saying is you don't go live the first day of the quarter and then Canvas grades everything automatically and then the last day of the quarter you say 3.6 and submit it in the instructor briefcase. You're there in that course being a part of it. Okay, we've already talked about academic integrity and accessibility. In copyright, what's happening is all the copyright stuff, all of the guidelines really expanded during coronavirus. Those are now starting to shrink back to where the basic copyright principles are back in play. So, you know, making a PDF of an entire textbook and posting in Canvas isn't going to happen anymore. My apologies. Okay. And then the last thing, I put this here because it's a great example. You have to provide resources for your students and you have to provide technical assistance to your students. Here's the great thing. Bates is already offering this and e-learning is already offering it. You just need to be aware that it's there. So if someone comes in and audits your program and they say, are you providing this? You say, yeah, here's the way that Bates provides resources to students. For example, they can sign up for counseling online if there's mental health issues. It would be a great example of something Bates offers and we have a help desk where they can call or do a Zoom meeting or send an email to from eight o'clock until 4.30 Monday through Friday. So they're getting equivalent help. So you had to do absolutely nothing except be aware of the fact that it existed and then answer that way if anyone ever asked you. So pretty simple, right? Okay, all right, so we are done. It is 3.52, and I'm sure everybody would like to stay here for an initial 20 minutes because they found this so fascinating and they have nothing else to do with their life. But I will ask, are there any questions or comments before we wrap it up here? So is there some point and some entity that's going to check this compliance at some point? I mean, or is it just something that gets looked at when we go through accreditation or? Uh, yes, yes and yes. Okay. So Thanks. you can requ you can request. First of all, you are we're going to give you the checklist so you can look at it on your own and go, do I meet these standards? Okay, and a lot of this is you know self-identify. And if you want it, kind of a judge's ruling like on copyright, call us and let us say, yeah, that meets the standard. Or, no, you can probably do ten pages. Fifty is too much. So we'll be happy to help you with that. And yes, you can actually have us look at a specific course, look at an English one hundred and one course, and say okay, I need someone to go through this because the creditors are coming, does it meet these standards? So yes, we will provide that assistance to you. 
Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions? The, the last thing I will just say is again, kind of wrap it up with an ad. Please keep your eye on the email. We're going to try not to flood you with stuff, but we are having a lot of trainings, a lot of resources that we're sending out to you guys. For example, we're going to send the mod zero out later tonight so that you can put that directly into your course. We've got trainings this week. So we'll, we'll send that out and try and send it kind of in a nice, easy to read function rather than, you know, a 40 page letter or 16 separate emails, make that easier for you guys. But more than anything, if there's anything we can do to help you guys, shoot us an email, you know, give us a call, whatever, and let us figure out how to come alongside and help you guys. Again, especially with this compliance thing that's kind of rearing its head over everything. Let's get some of this work done now rather than try and frantically get all this work done over winter break. Okay. And with that, thank you everybody for a great course, great training. We'll talk to you guys later.